stopped going to school. I started drinking alcohol, smoking weed, hanging around with the wrong people, got arrested multiple times, got suspended from school. I was obviously upset because of the divorce. Not sleep in a bed ever again, even now. He doesn't sleep in a bed? No. He was a one woman man. Do you think that to be successful, you have to have had some form of trauma? No, definitely not. So would you say then joining the Royal Marines was almost like an escape for you? It was absolutely an escape. Did you lose a few friends? Yeah. That? How was that when you kind of see them one day and they don't come back? Yeah, it's sad, man. It's very sad. It's fucking young guys, you know, just life gone. Gone. I was upset, angry and frustrated because I was about to die and I had massive regret that I was 21 and had not lived life. And this is where the story begins. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Daniel Lee's podcast. If this is your first time, welcome. Um, but if this is your uh, if you're a repeat listener, thank you for coming back. Um, I did notice though that on the statistics that a lot of people that watch and listen to this podcast haven't subscribed. So if you haven't already and you do love this and you and you listen to our episodes every week, please, please, please go over and uh, give us a follow, subscribe, because it means more than you can know. So yeah, thank you very much for that. And then also if you listen on an audio channel, you can rate the podcast now. And if you rate the podcast, what it does is it helps us rank better on those pages. So whatever you wanna give me, whether it's a one, two, three, four, or five, Beggars can't be choosers. If you just give us a ranking uh, and give us a five-star rating, if possible, uh, then that would be good because without that, we won't be able to get these amazing guests that we get every single week. So that leads me on nicely to this week's guest. We're joined by an ex Royal Marine commando who nearly lost his life uh, when he was serving in Afghanistan. Since then, he's gone on to compete and fight in Muay Thai competitions in Thailand, start his own successful business, and also has a podcast himself. And today, we're gonna get so deep on this conversation and his journey and just discuss everything to do with how he's been able to evolve over the years since his days in the military. So thank you very much again, guys. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, please join me in welcoming this week's guest, Cyrus. Rustum. Thanks, mate. Is that the right way? Rustum? It is. Perfect. Oh, wow. Where's Nailed that name from? Nailed it. My dad's parents are Iranian. Oh, wow. Actually. But I've never been to Iran. My yeah. dad grew up in the UK and I grew up in Wales. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, you know, I get some I get some really interesting requests sometimes about people wanting to join the podcast. But you know, when I uh, when I read your kind of bio, I was like, fucking hell, like <laughs> this is some story. So um, I'm really looking forward to kind of getting into things and 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 really just getting a bit deep with it, um, and just hoping to uh, inspire some people. So yeah, give us a brief intro of kind of who you are and what you do. Yeah. I run my business, which is Boxica, which is a boutique fitness studio based in Studio City, Dubai. I was, I've been in the fitness industry now for 15 years and I was a Royal Marines commando for five years. I traveled around the world and my passion is fitness, helping people. I, I coach people online as well. So I have clients that I help with mindset, nutrition, discipline, and that's pretty much it. But there was some interesting uh, traumas that I've had mm. and I in my life I I believe that I went through these experiences in life for a reason yeah I believe everything happens for a reason but I believe the universe puts you through situations and challenges so you can level up and um, I, I had some massive gifts and lessons from these experiences and as you mentioned one of them was you know I was I was pretty much almost had the life snatched out of me uh, and you get some unique perspectives on life through uh, you know almost dying yeah so rewinds to the earlier years and so before we come on to obviously your time in the in, in the marines um, yeah because this is going to be and again with the trauma side of things we will touch base on that so if anyone's listening don't worry i'm not skipping it i just want to go back to the very beginning give a bit <laughs> of context and uh take it from there so yeah, go back to, to your younger years and so family yeah. life you got brothers and sisters yeah i uh, I had a great upbringing up to around the age 13. So before that, as close to the word perfect as you could imagine an upbringing. Mm. Mum and dad together lived in Prestatin, which is a small town in North Wales. Prestatin. Prestatin, yeah. <laughs> Never heard of that place. <laughs> it's a beautiful town, but it's very boring. 
not a lot going on there. Yeah. And, you know, we had a dog and we weren't poor. We weren't rich. We were middle class. We had money. We had lots of gifts for Christmas and we never wanted for anything. And we were very close, right? We lived in the nicer part of town. So life was amazing. And one summer, we went on a family holiday with my mum. It was us kids. Yeah. I've got two sisters and a brother. I'm the eldest. And we went to Norfolk. And it was a little bit strange because normally we would stay around the North Wales area for our holidays. We'd go camping and stuff in Anglesey and that. And this time we went to Norfolk. And sure enough, this stranger was hanging around with our family and my mum. And I, I was old enough to kind of understand it was a bit off. And then when we went back home to our house, my, my parents announced that they were getting a divorce. Who was the stranger? It was a guy that my mum had met somehow and he was a stranger and he was also a strange man because he was actually a he was actually a weirdo. He was a bit strange, right? Yeah. And my mum had obviously planned to start a new life with him. And he was on the holiday with you? He showed up on the holiday. Where was your dad? He was working at home. Okay. I felt that it was off and his... his my brothers and sisters were maybe a little bit too young to to kind of get it, but I was, you know, 13 and I thought, you know, something, yeah. something's up here. You start to question things then, don't you? I was questioning it big time. And as soon as we got back to the to house after that, my mum and dad were just like, yeah, we're getting a divorce. And in those times, I didn't know too many people that had divorced parents. It was there. It was definitely, I knew a few people in school, but not too many. Mm. Right? And also as well, when you, uh, it's quite funny that you say this because your situation is like, I'm not even joking, like so close to identical to mine. Um, but even when you hear about people getting divorced, you don't understand it. You're just like, it's just weird that your parents and everything you know about growing up is about to change. Yeah. Dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it wasn't going to change dramatically. I thought everything was going to be okay. I understood that my parents were splitting up. Mm. But the plan was for my mum to get a house in North Wales. I was going to live with my dad. And my two sisters and brother were going to live with my mum very close by. And we were going to see each other every day. And life would go on as normal, except my parents were going to live in separate houses. Yeah. But obviously, it didn't go that way. My dad made it very clear from the get-go that he did not want this to happen. And I'd see him regularly on his knees, crying, pretty much begging my mum you know, don't leave. And I would join him sometimes, you know, get down and just cry and be like, please don't leave, please don't leave. And um, I think my mum must have sat down and wrote a list on a piece of paper. What are the actions that I can take from here that will make this divorce most painful for everyone involved? And I think she went down the list one by one and just went tick, 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 tick. I mean, she got a restraining order on my dad so we couldn't come near the house. She moved in the stranger into the house. So I'm like, you know, I'm like 13. This guy's living in my mum and dad's bed in our house and his kids are in the house. And my dad's not allowed anywhere near the house. And I found naked, weird naked photos of this guy in the house. Not naked photos, not weird photos, weird naked photos. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. <laughs> right? Fuck. And, um, my mo I got dragged to court and grilled by both of their lawyers. Uh, at 13 you know I just it was crazy and all the arguing and fighting and stress of it all come to this one day hmm. where my mum got full custody of the kids uh, and most of the assets and money and stuff I think it was normal in those days for the you know for that to happen and my dad still wasn't allowed in the house and she packed up everything and when I say packed up everything she left the wallpaper on the walls and took everything every single photo of their lives together 25 years was gone all the baby photos everything stripped and she told me get in the car i said nah i'm not i'm not going with you i want to stay with my dad um i know you're in the wrong i know my dad hasn't done anything wrong essentially and i don't want to go to the opposite ends of the country i know you actually want to do that you know although you said you were going to come here it's quite obvious you're going to leave and in my mind at that time because i was a mummy's boy I was the first born. We had a very close relationship. And I obviously loved my mum more than anything. And I thought, there's no way she's going to pick this guy over me. Like, at some point, she's going to realize, like, nah, th this is more important for me 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay in my hometown. And I thought if I was stubborn enough and I just held my ground that she would realize this and we could have that fairy tale divorce that I had in my mind, right? But how naive I was. Um, she chose him. Of course, yeah, she did. Yeah, she. Well, I wouldn't get in the car, so she called the police, and the police come in and said, "You got to go with your mum. The court's ordered it. You need to, uh, you know, go with her." And I, mate, I just felt this anger inside. It's yeah. just everything had just built up, and I wanted to lash out, but I knew if I did lash out, that they were going to grab me, and, you know, overpower me, and just throw me in the car. So I said to the policeman, "Listen, I'm not going anywhere. If you want me to go in the car, handcuff me and drag me into the car." And wherever it is you're taking me, you better tie me down because I'm coming straight back here. So he looked at my mum and said, do you really want us to do this? Like, he really doesn't want to leave, you know? So the police left and my mum left. And that was uh, in 20 years after that, I probably spoke to my mum a handful of times. 20 years? 20 years, yeah. <sighs> and so in that moment when she left, I obviously was heartbroken, you know, 13 years old, mum's gone. And I built up some beliefs in that moment to protect myself. Mm. And I know this now because I've done loads of deep work yeah. to unravel that. What were those beliefs that you built up? So the first one was that relationships don't work. I watched my dad not eat properly for years, not sleep in a bed ever again, even now. And completely- He doesn't sleep in a bed? No. Where does he sleep? On the couch. Fuck. Never slept in a bed after my mum uh, left him. He was a one woman man mm. and she did that to him in that way. He's still bare about it today. Like <laughs> he won't get over it. Yeah. Um, and so relationships don't work. And that belief became a part of me, right? Everything I did from that moment was relationships don't work. And the second belief that I built up was that, cause I woke up the next day and I don't know what I was expecting, but I was like, I'm okay. Physically I'm fine. I was, went about my day and I was like, huh. My mum's just left me. My sisters and brother have gone and I'm okay. So I thought, wow, I'm really, I'm quite strong. I'm unbreakable. I'm, I'm stronger than what I think I am. And I actually still carry that belief today. Um, so apart from my son, if anything happened to my son, I'm a broken man. But apart from that, emotionally wise, I, f I feel like I can get through anything. Cause I, I saw my dad and how it broke him. And I'm like, I wouldn't let anyone do that to me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like another human cannot do that to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, apart from obviously something happening to my son. But so my dad had an interesting way of parenting me. His dad, my granddad, was quite strict and he forced a career on my dad. Uh, he made him uh, become an engineer. My dad wanted to work with animals and be a vet. So my dad having that upbringing give me complete autonomy over my life from 13. I'm talking like, you do whatever you want. There's food in the cupboards. I'm going to give you the 60 pounds a month that the government gives me for being a single parent. I'm going to give it to you. You manage that and do what you want, basically. Mm. So I stopped going to school. Oh, so you stopped, yeah. I started drinking alcohol, smoking weed, living on the street, uh, not living on the streets, but hanging around with the wrong people, got arrested multiple times, got suspended from school. I was obviously upset. Because of the divorce, right? Yeah, you can't express your emotions. Uh, mate, I literally cannot believe how identical our stories are. It's crazy. It's, really? Yeah, it's it's. How old were you when your parents divorced? I was about 12, 13 years old. Same thing. Went down the crime route, drinking alcohol, taking drugs. <laughs> like, yeah. That's because insane. The thing is, you don't understand the emotions. So you kind of, like, you, like you say, you find these coping mechanisms. But when you have those coping mechanisms, it it only copes to a certain amount and then you just mm. explode mm. and sometimes that was in forms of getting super drunk to the yeah. point where you're just like you wake up you don't even know where you are or fighting with people yeah um i had so much anger inside me oh. you know and the problem is is like the difference between our situation was that um you know my dad was a bit of an angry man so like i don't blame my mum for leaving him right. but in the same same breath like the way it all happened and went down mm. it was very, very, not similar to yours as in moving away. We still live in the same town and stuff, but right. there was a lot that went on that was just like, it, yeah. and it, it, like you say, I, 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 can, I sit here knowing exactly how you felt because nothing mm. else mattered after that. It was just, yeah. you had, I, it was the opposite way around. I had a mum who was so focused on a new relationship that I had full autonomy of my life. Really? And it was like, 
you know and i don't blame her i suppose in in hindsight and like you say doing a lot of work you just I suppose different to your situation but with mine it was like she didn't experience love for a very long time so then when she got it it was like she just held on for dear right. life you know right um yeah. but as a child you know you just feel neglected and absolutely absolutely yeah. so I, I i sit here fully understanding the situation yeah um because like you say when you've got no guidance around you you just you just like fuck it i don't want to learn about anything you know yeah i don't want to go to school no mate i i didn't understand why i had to go to this place that they were teaching boring subjects they were boring people i hated school i i, I mean my name's cyrus it's not you know john or you know it, we were in north wales mm. i was one of three kids in the whole school that didn't have pure white skin so i was an out i was an outcast i had just been through this divorce and i didn't exactly like, like you said i didn't know how to express myself mm. there's a lot of anger inside and frustration so i was taking it out for, with alcohol and drugs and do you ever take it out on your dad we fought a lot yeah but my dad was a sweetheart he like i would call my dad at like four o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and Sunday, pissed drunk in the town next door. And without a doubt, he would say, I'm on my way. Yeah. Dad, can you pick me up? I'm on my way. You know, he, he he would never let me want for anything. If he had money and I asked him for it, he would just give me money. If he didn't have it, he'd say, I don't have it. Yeah. can't give it you. So he was always there for me. And because his dad forced a career upon him, one thing my dad did give me, uh, he didn't give me any direction or discipline, but he was always there for me. And he always told me, you can do anything you want. Like straight up, if those people can do it, you can do it. And, yeah. and he instilled that belief in me. And he still does today. I, t I tell him my wacky goals and he's like, if anyone can do it, you can do it. You know, he still yeah. says that same. Yeah. So he, he had a unique way of parenting. And don't forget, he was a broken man, right? He was completely broken. Yeah. I mean, have you, have you ever had heartache before? Have you ever been like broken up from a girl that you really loved? Yeah yeah oh yeah it's painful isn't it oh man I, I yeah my first girlfriend i was with her for two or three years and i thought i wanted to split up with her and the second we split up it was a phone call i was in the marines at the time i just completely died inside i was writing her love letters i was writing love letters to her mom like i was yeah. broken because <laughs> you go through these self sub i mean you know this from probably doing a lot of work you go through this self-sabotage where your mind is telling you like things are better on the other side, you know what I mean? The grass yeah. is greener and then it yeah. fucks you up. Yeah, I immediately realized in the moment that the phone went down, like, oh, what have I done, you know? The Did she get just... back with you? No, she didn't. I'm glad she didn't because mm. that relationship was not meant to be. I think she'd actually met someone else already Okay, because I was away in the Marines a lot and yeah. I wasn't really paying much attention. I kind of like knew that I wasn't supposed to be with her, but I didn't realize how much I loved her. Yeah. And so when it broke, I broke, but it lasted like three weeks. You know, three weeks, I was really devastated, crying and writing love letters and everything. And then after that, I kind of got my shit together. Three weeks and one day, like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> yeah. I, I like, said to my friend the other day, I'm like, I hope she didn't keep those letters because if she ever brings them out, I'm just going to be <laughs> devastated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to take this guy down. That would be hilarious. That would be hilarious. Um, so how how's the relationship with you, mom, now? Now, so I uh, I went through some work that I did that made me realize that I needed to re-engage with my mom. Mm. So I called her for the first time in 20 years, wanting to speak to her. I mean, we had maybe a handful of times contact her attempts, but uh, I wasn't interested. Um, and I realized, and then I called her and I said, I want to build a relationship with you. And we have spoke and she's come to Dubai a couple of times and we have a normal relationship. I speak to her maybe like once every three months or something. Um, and that for me is, you know, good enough. I talk to my dad weekly, you know, very close to my dad. And I think just because of the distance for so long, I don't really, yeah, I haven't really got that connection with her anymore. You know, I, I lost that a long time ago, you know? Yeah. And there's the, the sad thing is for me now is not that it's my sisters and brother, you know, cause I see them grow up together. They look after each other's kids and they're very close to each other. And, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not close to them at all. I'm the outcast, you know. I, yeah. I, I meet them sometimes when I go to the UK and, you know, we chat and stuff, but I never call them, never speak to them. It's just 
I don't really know them that well, you know. Yeah, that's a shame. That that is a shame. I mean, that's one thing that I'm I'm grateful that I have is like a really close relationship with my brother and sister. Um, yeah. I mean, even though you do a lot of work and that, it, it it does go to show like the type of character that you are for that. Because even listening to that, I think I would struggle to to. There's there's a part of me it doesn't matter. I mean, I do a lot of therapy as well, but even with that therapy, like there's still th- like for me, certain people's actions like when they cross a certain line, I find it very, very difficult to like yeah. forgive them fully, you know? Yeah. It's not like it hold anything within me. It's just that I just kind of, okay, goodbye. There is you a know? bit of that there. There is mm-hmm. a bit of that. I mean, for sure. I don't have a relationship with my two sisters and my brother because of my mum, you know? And she actually said when she was here that she regrets all of it. And so well and good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, you know, I, I, I'm close with my dad. I have a very strong, very close relationship with my dad. I tell him everything and I speak to him, if not once a week, twice a week. And that for me is is great, you know? Yeah, because I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, I mean, I remember when I was very similar age to when my parents broke up and I just had this realization that how I'd saw life was the complete opposite because you think that everything's good and fine and you get to go out and play and then these sudden life events happen where you're like, okay, shit, life is, life is real bad yeah. things happen yeah. and this is what life is really like and i think you know we don't ever get taught by the disney films and stuff that these mm. these things happen it's all like f- happily mm. ever after um but on the plus side at least you've got a really good relationship with your dad yeah like that's the most important thing i'd say and how about friendships like do you do you have really good friendships with people mate my i do and, and i think that's where i made made up for the lack of having my sisters and brother around yeah. Especially when I'm the, when I went in the military, that was my family. Yeah, you know the the how close you are to your friends in the Marines, you're very close anyway. Mm. But I accepted them as my family. Yeah, and I love that's one of the best things I got from the military. You know, at the time, it was I felt like I belonged, and I had all these guys around me. Yeah, and we and we had similar backgrounds actually. Yeah. You know, so that was really good for me. Yeah, I um. I wanted to save this all to the end, but I suppose as we're on the topic, um, do you think, because I mean, I've speak to a lot of successful people and rarely do they come from really good upbringings. Mm. So do you think that to be successful, you have to have had some form of trauma? No, definitely not. No, I, I don't. I don't. I honestly don't think it has much to do with, uh, look, if my parents didn't divorce and I didn't go through almost dying in Afghanistan, I wouldn't be where I am today for sure. But I don't know where I would have been. I don't know. If it wasn't for that, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'd have been somewhere better. Maybe I'd have been more secure in my mind. I don't know. I would have gone to university and maybe I would have became a doctor. I don't know. Probably not. But um, I don't think it's a necessity. I do think that if you if you come from a good upbringing and you know your parents are still good values in you and you can still be successful financially and relationship wise and yeah. we all have issues you know mm. with the varying degrees of problems but I think we all have traumas that we carry from childhood I mean a trauma can be um if you you're a single child and your parents have another kid that can be trauma because yeah. now there's or this other person in your life who's your sibling, but they're getting all the attention, right? So mm-hmm. There's varying levels of trauma, and I believe everyone carries something. Uh, but I, I don't think you need to come from a, a terrible background to um, to make money and be successful now. Um, is she still with him? No. Nope. He was a weirdo. Um, so she literally left. <laughs> like that, that's even more painful, man. At 13, hell. I understood that this man was strange. He was a weird guy and his kids uh, were honestly like, it's like they've been living in a cave and they just come out the cave and like were walking around. They didn't know how to like speak and talk to people. Like it was, they were weird. And my, I don't know why my mum didn't see that, but she married him. Um, and the, the funny thing is, <clears throat> I don't know what was going through my sisters and brothers' minds, right? But I do know my sister got pregnant very young and got out of that house and went to live with this guy. Maybe it was because she didn't like that environment and she needed to get out. So she you know, got pregnant from this guy that was way older than her and she moved out. I think she got pregnant initially at, I don't know how old she was, 16, 17, 18, something like that. Hmm. Maybe, or maybe 20, I don't know. But it was she was young. She must have been 16, 17 when she got pregnant because she wow. she, she, she left. And then my my brother got with a very older woman 
Uh, she, I think he was 13 when he met her and she was like 36, 40. Shut up. Yeah, and he had two girls and now he's just left the mum recently. She was she like 70 years old? Like. Yeah, yeah, she's like, yeah, yeah, like 50, 50 odd and she's like overweight and um, the girls are beautiful girls. He's got two girls out of that relationship, right? Lily and Daisy, they're great. And my sister, the kid that she had, she's like 17, 18 now and she's beautiful and, uh, you know, she wants to be a model. And so the kids are fantastic, you know, uh, but they got themselves into that situation at that young age. And I believe it's because they just didn't like the situation at home, you know, with this weird guy. So my mum left him and went on to uh, to another relationship. And now she's married to this other guy. But I think my mum's not meant to really be with anyone. You know, she, I think she's a free spirit. She likes her freedom. She likes to meet different people. And I believe that's the kind of person she is. Yeah. So would you say then joining the Royal Marines was almost like an escape for you? It was absolutely an escape, yeah. 100%. When I was looking at your story, I was thinking, why would anyone want to choose that path? Yeah. So I was in school and I was troubled, obviously. I told you that I was going through all that. And uh, one of my best friends at the time, Andy, he was from a a broken family. His sister was bringing him up. His dad worked in Saudi. His mum, I think he never even met her. She was an alcoholic. So we, we created this bond and he walked into school one day <clears throat> and showed me a photograph. And I looked at the photograph and instantly knew that was my path. Mm. Before he said anything, a light bulb went off and it was a photo of his older brother. And he was a Royal Marines commando. He had a commando green berry on he had the uniform on. Mm. He was on, on an exercise somewhere. And then Andy told me, like, this is one of the hardest trainings to go in the military. And you have to be really fit to join. And my brother's going on all these adventures around the world. And I was, like, in awe of it. Mm. Wow. So How old were you at that point? It was, uh, it must have been maybe almost 14. Yeah. Yeah, 13, 14, around there. So I, I mean, I stopped the weed. I didn't stop the alcohol necessarily. I was still not going to school. My attendance during the last year of high school was 43%. I still remember that number being on the report. But the next morning after seeing this photo, I put shorts on, woke up at 5 a.m. and went for a run. And on that run, this is a moment that I'm proud of myself for. is because I'm running and literally every step, I'm like, go back to bed, go back to bed, go back to bed. Like I didn't want to be doing that. And it was uncomfortable for me and I was out of shape and I was blowing out my ass and I was running around the town. And I had this like understanding that I could stop at any time and I could walk back home, climb into my warm, comfy bed and just fall asleep. Mm. And that was accepting my reality, which for me at the time was hell. I hated it. So I knew that in order to do this, I had to put up with this short, pain that I was going through, this small amount of pain of running, the physical pain of this was like nowhere near the mental torture of this life. Of that, yeah, yeah. So I got it. I got it. Day one, I understood I need to do this. So me and my friend Andy were obsessed with physical training. Like, honestly, like going down to the beach before the sun come up in the middle of the UK winter, in the rain and the wind, in shorts and t-shirts, in the ocean, right? Running up and down the beach with the sea up to our knees, doing push-ups, sit-ups and squats, training because we both needed to escape and we both wanted to be Royal Marines commandos. And so I, you know, the story of, tra of commando training for me is quite an interesting one because I walked into the recruitment office in Wrexham when I was 15 and nine months old on the day because you had to be 15 and nine months old to apply to join. And the recruitment officer just looked at me and said, Nia, you're too young, come back when you're older. And I was like, nah, I'm 15 and nine months old. And he was like, hmm, you've done your research. Okay, well, boys your age don't usually pass commando training. Only a very small percentage get through. So come back when you're older. And I was just like, nah. Like he didn't obviously know what I got to and all the training I'd done to get to that point. And so he agreed to let me on the PRMC, which is the Potential Royal Marines course. It was a three-day course down at the Commando Training Center to see if you were good enough to go into commando training. And I obviously smashed it, right? I'm just like so keen and fit by that point. 
So he said, okay, fair enough. Like you're, you, you, you're not just talking. A lot of the boys that come into my office say they're going to train on this. You've obviously done the work, but I still think you should wait. Like you're still not fully developed. It's hard training. It's one of the longest, hardest military training courses in the world from civilian into military. Anyway, convinced him, dad signed the papers, I got in. And it was easy physically for me training. Like I was probably too fit going into it. I was one of the top two or three fittest in the whole troop. Smashed it. Got to week 27. There was 32 weeks of training at the time. And that was when he did the commando tests. And there's four commando tests. Uh, the endurance course, two mile run in swamps, rivers and uh, tunnels. You got to go through a fully submerged water tunnel and all this stuff with your rifle. But yeah, um, the commando test. So the first one is the endurance course, two miles, for, uh, like cross country, rivers, swamps, tunnels. So the tunnel was underwater, so you had to swim for it. One of them is, yeah, someone pushes you under. You go through, you put your arms out, and then eventually the other guy grabs you and he pulls you to the other side and you come out the top and then you get your rifle and you carry on running. Wow. Uh, there's like swamps, like up to your chest swamps, and you have to keep your rifle above it. Uh, and you try and it's a timed run and they do a four mile run back to camp. So two miles of this, four miles back to camp. You must have been so fit after that. Crazy fit. Yeah. Yeah, crazy fit. It's just like almost superhuman fit. And then you shoot your rifle at the end to prove that you can get your rifle through all that and to prove that you can shoot accurately after going through that course. That's the endurance course. But that wasn't hard for me at all. That was like a breeze. I was so fit. The Tarzan assault course is a 30 foot in the air rope assault course in the trees. No safety nets with kit on and weight and everything. Followed by the normal assault course. And it's like a 15 minute lung buster. And then you do the nine mile speed march, which is a very fast nine miler with your kit. And then you've got the 30 miler, which is a notoriously hard test. It's 30 miles across mountainous terrain with all your kit and rifle and guys have died on it many times. And so I failed the first time I got, and the training took its toll on me, right? You lose a lot of weight in training. In, in the Royal Marines training, you get four meals a day, not the standard British military three, because you just can't eat enough calories for the amount of energy. Yeah. No. So you, you're really depleted and tired and, and, and skinny. And um, I got this infection in my knee. It was a small cut and it got infected. And the training team moved me into the troop behind and said, look, you're obviously going to make it Cyrus, just not with us. Go and heal, come through with the troop behind and then pass everything. So I went back in the next troop. I got through the first two commando tests. Failed the third one. This infection was getting worse and I was hiding it from everyone because I was scared they were going to pull me out of training if they saw how bad it was. My knee was blowing up. The veins in my leg were a luminous red and it was actually quite serious. And But I was just like, just get through these tests and then sort it out. Went through uh, 860, 860. Third time went to, through the commando test. Got through the first three tests. Got to the 30 miler the morning of. Threw up my food because I was so sick at this point from the infection. I was like sweating, flu-like symptoms, leg was all blowing up. It come up into my hip, went for a pee. It was like brown. I didn't realize how serious it was. I just thought, oh, I'll take some drugs after this, and, you know, sort it out. Started the 30 miler, got between mile 20 and 25 and my body just went, nope. Yeah. <laughs> You're done. Collapsed. They threw me in a river. I was overheating and I was hyperventilating quite aggressively. So they um, took me to hospital, obviously the military hospital and on the camp there, stripped me off, put fans on me. I was in and out of consciousness and I woke up and the doctor was pissed. Like I remember him standing at the end of my bed with his arms crossed, just waiting to absolutely blast me. Yeah. Um, and he did, he was like, recruit Rustam. This is, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like not that long ago, I wouldn't have asked you any questions. I would have put you to sleep and chopped your leg off. This is that serious. I'm not joking. And you might still lose it. It was, it was bad. Anyway, put me full of drugs. Infection went down. Got um, recovered in the in the special unit in training where you can recover, and then went back into training and obviously passed. But the lessons from that, looking back and and at the time, first of all, I had no plan B. There was nothing else for me. So 
although I was going through all this and I was sick and I was infected and I kept failing many times the commando test, not once did I think in my mind, I'm going to go home and quit because there was nothing else for me. So I learned at 16 years old, don't set a plan B. Set your plan A, fucking go for it, right? The second thing I got from it was, do you know how many times I told my dad that I was going to be a Marine and how many times he told me, yeah, you can do it. So the thought of going back home and looking my dad in the face and saying I couldn't make it, not an option for me. Yeah, I honestly would rather have died doing it and him remember me as the son that never give up and was chasing his dreams than to go back with my tail between my legs and admit defeat. Not an option. Not an option. No thanks. I'll die doing it. And I used to tell myself that. Honestly, I used to tell myself in my head, it's either die or get the commando green berry. So a couple of lessons learned that I carried with me after that. And I had this mindset from my divorce that I was actually unbreakable. And all the stuff that they threw at me in commando training, all this was honestly nothing compared to, you know, my mum leaving me. Mm. And so I, I had that to compare it with. And, um, you know, my the Marines was the best thing for me, honestly. Like I went to my unit, we were close knit you know we train together we sleep together we not necessarily not was there anyone you didn't like yeah there was one guy uh, there was two guys there was two guys two guys that actually hated me so i hated them i didn't hate i didn't dislike why, why did that why did they hate you there was one scottish guy called murchie uh, in training and he absolutely hated me was, he, was his surname murdoch by any chance <laughs> as i even call him murdy <laughs> he was big jock guy and he, he was very insecure and I don't know, he saw something in me that he didn't like and he, he hated me and he used to give me shit all the time. Um, but he, Do you ever he, have any scraps with these boys or? No. No. Never. No. No. And there was one guy in my unit, Matt, uh, who, who hated me as well. He just disliked me and I, I didn't have anything against him. I thought he was all right, but he just hated me. I don't know why. Um, in the Marines, when you join your unit, you are what's called a sprog. You're a young Marine and you do all the shit jobs and <laughs> you do something called the joining run. And it's the humor in the military is 10 X civilian humor. Anything you find funny, it's not funny in the military. It needs to be extreme for it to be. Yeah. Funny. You have to be like, yeah, I know a few military lads and they're fucking wild. Like <laughs> the way that they like joke with each other. I'm like, wow, I'm pretty savage, but like these boys are like next level. C completely savage. I mean, the jokes, like my, my first day of commando training, they lined everyone up on the parade square and the, the drill sergeant, you start with the drill sergeant, uh, the, the drill leader, because he teaches you how to clean yourself properly, how to iron your unit, the basics. You start with the basics, right? You don't do the fun stuff like throwing grenades and jumping out of helicopters in day one. You do the, the boring stuff. And he walked up to me, if it was 60 of us that started, got right in my face and went, you're a fucking poo baby, aren't you? Because <laughs> I had brown skin. <laughs> and the guys are like, <clears throat> and I was just like, <laughs> um, but when you get to your unit, you do a joining run. <laughs> it's so <laughs> racist, isn't it? <laughs> it's so funny though. I mean, honestly, you just if you have anything about you, yeah, they're they're looking out for weaknesses, right? So like, if 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 he thinks that you're like sensitive to a bit of a racial joke, then he's gonna come for you hard. You need to have thick skin, and it's all funny. It's all fun and games at the end of yeah. the day. Like the the training team in training thought I looked like I used to have really buck teeth, really goofy teeth because I sucked my thumb so much as a kid, as a baby. And um, I looked, they thought I looked like uh, Freddie Mercury from Queen, right? So what they did once is they, they played the Queen album. And funnily enough, my dad used to play Queen on repeat. Yeah. Like Queen and Beethoven, repeat. That was the only music he listened to. So I know all the words. And they, they put a black masking tape mustache on my skin and told me to stand there and sing every sing and dance through every single song of the Queen album. And you were able to do it. And I knew all the words. And they, so they initially, they knew like, oh my God, he knows the words. So they, they stood me there for like an hour. Um, so in the unit, yeah, back to my uh, my story when you join, they, they have something called a joining run. And it's notoriously like, like it's a thing that you do. When you get to your unit, you have to go through this. Uh, it's like a party right? Everyone's drinking and they make you do these like funny games, essentially. 
and at the end of it they shake your hand and welcome you officially to the to the unit welcome to the unit you know mm. and uh you know they told us right show up at like 6 p.m with no hair on your body except for your eyebrows naked right so we all show up all the new guys completely naked on only <laughs> eyebrows. we have like completely na- not a hair on your body right, right. is it no clothes you. as well completely naked <laughs> walk there with no hair on your body except for your eyebrows like zero hair like shaved everything completely legs arms everything Uh, and it's um so they give you like these pints of whiskey pure whiskey and like drink it drink it um they they make you they pee in the whiskey as well so you're drinking like piss and whiskey together Uh, so so, uh, they give you uh like big uh one and a half two liter um, bottles of whole milk and you have to like down it and then do burpees. So uh, obviously at some point it's just going to like projectile out. <laughs> right. And then they uh, made us like fight each other with uh, like yoga mats, basically our roll mats that we use when we go on exercise on our hands, just like play fighting, like not really punching each other naked. Um, and then <laughs> we were playing like human- <laughs> all while you're naked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything's there. Yeah. You don't put any clothes on. You had, we had this like slope. And we would like, they put a hose pipe on the slope to make it all muddy. And then the guys would stand at the bottom facing away. And then the person would have to sprint on the gla- on the grass, nose dive down. And then they hit everyone like human bowling, they were calling it, to see how many like pins they can knock over. <laughs> it and, sounds fucking hilarious. It, oh, mate. It was, uh, I, th- I think they stopped them because someone took a load of photos and the papers got it. And they put it out in the UK so that they come like quite strict on it. I'm sure they do some version of it now. Mm. But they they had a catapult. I don't know where they got this cardboard from. Like one guy holds one end, the other guy holds the other end. There was three thick rubber bands, and then they were oh. firing. Um, they were firing water balloons at us, double water balloons, and it cracked a double glazing window. That's how powerful it was. And we had to walk on the wall pretending <laughs> to be crabs, <laughs> and these water balloons were swinging. I took one to the the left peck. And, um, mate, mate, it was, it was honestly, it was this big and black for like four weeks after it. <laughs> One guy got hit in the back of the head. There's there no smashed, there's blood everywhere. And the final thing was the, the troop line up in two lines, take their flip flops off and you had to walk through the line slowly, non-emotionally, not a single emotion on your face. And they were slapping you with their flip flops as hard as they could. And you get to a thick, uh, rose bush and he had to do a front flip into the rose bush oh, so I was man. third in line that must have been so painful yeah it was the, the first guy got halfway through the the row of uh, flip flop slaps and m- made out a cry and they said get back get to the back and I was like okay so don't don't do that because they will actually make you go to the back the guy in front of me got all the way through the flip flops and then dived into the bush but didn't do a flip but nope, you got to do a front flip, go to the back. And I was like, man, I'm not doing this twice. So got through, did the biggest flip I've ever done in my life, landed in this thick bush of like nettles and roses. And they said, yeah, well done. And I'm like, oh, but I'm stuck in this bush now. And I just went, three, two, one, you know, just like got out and oh my God, the next day. But they shake your hand after it. Welcome to the company. And that's just to give you an idea of like normal jokes in the military are not funny you know yeah. you, need, you need to take it to extreme but it's for a reason i mean you're brainwashed mm. you go to war together you need that to be so close to each other and, yeah um yeah it was funny how long was it until you went on your first assignment i was supposed to go to iraq when i first got there but i was in trouble with the police for uh, an incident in my hometown like a fighting drunken incident so i was put on a travel ban so I didn't go, unfortunately, to, or fortunately. Uh, everything happens for a reason. Mm. I wasn't meant to go to Iraq for a reason. But uh, Afghanistan was 2006, and that was my one and only tour. And when did you join? I went in to training around 2002, I believe. Oh, wow. So it was literally four years until you actually went out and... Yeah. Yeah, a year of training. And then... What would you do in between the time then of like... When you weren't out on a tour, like what was what would you have to do? Yeah, a normal day was quite chill on camp. Um, and we you know we'd do a lot of training and we'd go out on exercises around the UK, just practicing our job. We went to Europe a few times, working with other European forces and going in helicopters. And when we actually did something, it was yeah. fun, you know. We'd go cliff jumping and 
stuff and it was we go on ships a lot of the time with the navy because we are attached to the navy as a royal marine just practicing you know just pr like you would in, in a job just doing doing stuff and um afghanistan was uh it was quite surreal before we went like i remember sat in my room with all my kit desert kit and at the time we were in devon and it was in the summer it was a beautiful day and we were our camp was on this like estuary and we would go into town drink party sleep with girls you know, we were living like a in a bubble there you know in mm. the military everything was taken care of we you kind of do what you wanted as well because you knew you'd always get away with it absolutely absolutely <clears throat> and there was always a big group of you right so no one could really say anything even the doormen in the clubs and stuff couldn't really do anything there's like 30 odd of you you know so we would go out dressed like women dressed like superheroes we'd, we'd go to we'd literally go to Woolworths was the shop at the time pick a five to seven year old fairy outfit squeeze it on some somehow go into town and just cause havoc you know and you know we got arrested a few times and it, it was fun um but i just remember sitting there in my desert uniform thinking wow like we're going from this to war mm. like, there's no in between and we i don't know what i was expecting going to afghanistan but when we arrived we went to camp kandahar first which was the large american base there this was post 9 11 right this was 2006. 9-11 was 2001, right? Yeah. Yeah, 2006. So it was all popping off in Afghanistan. 2006 was, yeah. Yeah, big time. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a, very much a war zone. Uh, but we, we arrived on Camp Kandahar, which was the American base. And it, the Americans do things differently. Their budget for, for, the, uh, for their military is insane you know, for the defense and the camp was unreal. It was like KFCs and Burger Kings there and the food was really nice in the in the food halls and they had all these energy drinks and fridges and in the British military, we had none of that. So we were like, wow, this is not what we were expecting. You know, we mm -hmm. were expecting war. But we eventually made it to the British uh, base, which was Camp Bastion. And people ask me all the time, you know, how was your Afghanistan experience? And, and, you know, did you kill anyone and all this? And my personal experience of Afghanistan was touch wood, combat wise, very easy. Didn't have to shoot my rifle at anyone. Definitely didn't kill anyone. Um, we went on a few uh, operations, like um, missions in Sangin Valley and to the forward operating bases. And there was bullets and bombs going off, but nothing touched me. And I wasn't in a situation where I had to shoot someone and I'm very glad of that because a lot of my friends, some of them died, some of them lost limbs, some of them killed people and now are suffering for it. Yeah. You know? um, I was going to say, have you, that was part of some of the questions that I had of obviously you haven't killed someone, but have you ever seen, did you see somebody die when you were there? There was one incident where a vehicle was coming towards us in the middle of the desert it was full of guys. It was a truck. It was a red truck. And it was bobbing it towards us. And it wouldn't stop. And in that scenario, the first thing you do is you put a few rounds in, in into the desert in front of the vehicle to let them know you mean business. So the guys at the front of the convoy, 50 cal rounds are massive. If a 50 cal round hits the floor near you, you are shitting your pants, right? Mm. It doesn't have to hit you, it could kill you just whizzing past you. That's how big the rounds are and powerful they are. So a couple of rounds into the desert in front of the vehicle, it kept coming. The next thing you do is put a couple of rounds into the bonnet. Dun dun. By that point, if you're still coming, you mean you, you're trying to do damage to us, do you know what I mean? So uh, a few seconds after that, they just killed everyone in, in the vehicle and we just carried on. We didn't even go and check the vehicle, you know. It was a war. Mm. Uh, if you feel like someone looks dodgy, you can kill them and not get in trouble for it. Yeah, there's a lot. It's, I actually did a podcast with somebody that was in the army and there is a lot of red tape around killing people, right? It's like, it's, it's not just like you pull out your gun and you actually, what I didn't realize is that you have to literally like warn them to the point of like almost you're dying before you shoot them. Yeah. <clears throat> in 2006, in certain areas where we were in Sangin Valley, there wasn't any of that. If you thought someone was dangerous, you kill them. Mm. And that was the rule. That was what they told us. If you think someone is carrying a weapon and they're going to uh, they're going to do damage or they're, they're a suicide bomber or anything like that, shoot them. Yeah. So unf unfortunately, there is people that get through 
military training and go to war and they just want to kill people. I didn't know anyone personally in my group who wanted to just kill someone for the sake of it. But there is people that, that go in the military and do that. Yeah. There's, there's weirdos everywhere, you know? Mm. Um, and we, you know, we were playing volleyball and telling jokes as normal and living life out there, but we just have to go out on the ground a few times. And, you know, our, our unit did have it quite soft the time I was there. And after I left, you know, they, they probably got into some, some other things, but um, I'm grateful that it was not bad, yeah. you know? Um, and then you said about obviously losing friends and stuff. Like, did you lose a few friends on yeah. that tour? Yeah. How was that when you kind of see them one day and then come, and then they do come, don't come back? Yeah, it's sad, man. It's very sad. It's fucking young guys, you know, just life gone, gone. You don't you don't join the military to you lose your life, you know. Um, one of my friends, one of my very good friends, brother, uh, who was in our same unit, those two brothers, um, died. The bomb went off next to him, and it was uh, it stopped his heart. And it was I, I watched my friend just, you know, I remember going to the funeral and hugging him. And feeling him shake and just being like, oh my God, like, mm. you know, his, his brother, his best friends uh, died and other guys died as well. And yeah, it's, it's just sad. Yeah. It's just sad, especially looking back, being older, right. And, have, and being able to have that empathy and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And especially now I've got a kid, you know, oh mm. my God, I wouldn't wish my son to go in the military and do that stuff. No way. Yeah. So, um, you've obviously ended up leaving camp, but on uh, pretty unfamiliar circumstances, right? Yeah. Take us back to the day um, of that particular incident. Yeah. What actually happened? Yeah, we were on camp and the captain uh, gave us this like bullshit job, we would call it. It was just like, guys, go and pick up this package that's being delivered to the airstrip. Take these two vehicles, pick up the stuff and come back. And we're like, okay, you know. Um, so one of the vehicles wasn't working. It wouldn't start. You had to bump. You had to jump start it. So you had to get it moving so you could start the engine. So we put used the tow bar, pulled it, started it, unhooked it, drove to the airstrip. Me and one of the guys, Smarty, my friend, turned the vehicles off, got the package, did the same thing, got it go in the engine. I jumped out of the front vehicle and and went in between the vehicles and unhooked the tow bar, which was attaching both vehicles together. I took it off the rear vehicle first. And then the rear vehicle came forward. I was still in between. And <clears throat> it was trying to move forward, but the front vehicle was there and it was just kind of like hitting it and moving back. And the vehicles had armor on them and the armor started around where my neck was. And so that my friend got out of the rear vehicle while it was still trying to move forward, had a look in between them to see what was going on and saw my head in between getting bashed, reversed back and then... I had had my head, you know, smashed up. I didn't know the extent of the injuries, obviously, but I broke my jaw in three places, completely crushed the right side of like all my eye socket area and my skull had been broken all over, basically. My head had been squashed. And I initially like brushed it off, you know, like, but then realized, like, oh, oh, shit. I lied down on the floor and then people were gathering around me and my friends had, were holding on to me and I could hear what people were saying. The blood was dripping out my eyes, nose, mouth, ears. And then I was like, fuck, this is bad. And I was in no pain, zero pain. Adrenaline was obviously pumping, yeah? Zip, didn't feel a thing the whole time. <clears throat> and my friends were holding on to my hands and, and I could hear everyone talking. And I was thinking, it hit me that I was going to die. I was dying. I would have died if they hadn't have come and got me and take me to the hospital and did what they did. So I got clarity in that moment, right? Just about to die. No ego, no fear. This is it, right? And I was upset. I was super upset. I started screaming and squeezing the hands of my friends out of frustration because I was like, fuck. This is my life. I've done nothing. I went to school. I went in the military. I'm 21 years old and I'm about to die on this fucking desert floor in Afghanistan. And I was upset and angry and frustrated. 
And the, my friends had to let go of my hands because I was squeezing them so tight and I was so annoyed. And I couldn't speak and say words because my jaw was all messed up. It felt like an hour I was lying on the floor. It must have been like 10 minutes or something. The ambulance come and they took mm. me to the hospital and they did a scan and they were like, oh, we can't do anything here. We need to send you to a bigger hospital in Kandahar, the American base that we initially went to. They didn't even have the doctors or the or the, the um, you know, facilities on Kandahar to deal with this kind of injury. They took me to Oman and somewhere along the line, I fell into a coma and I was like pretty much just hanging on, you know, by a thread. They had me on all these machines and tubes and stuff, keeping me alive in intensive care. Did your dad know about it? Well, they shut all communication with home when something like this happens, when someone dies, right? No one's allowed to call home until the military go and tell the next of kin. I fell into the coma, so right, we're going to go and tell the dad. The Royal Marines officer and priest went to my dad's house and he was at work. So they went to, the, the neighbors told him where he worked. There's like a security gate to the compound where my dad works and then there's the factory, which he's worked at that point for maybe 25 years or something. And the, they show up at the front gate and we're here to see Eddie Rustam. And they go, yeah, he's in, that, he's in that room there. They obviously know what's going on, right? Calls my dad, mate, come outside. There's two gentlemen are here to see him. My dad's like, what? what are you talking about? He's like, please come outside. Just come and see them, mate. You want to see them. So dad comes to the entrance of the factory. The guys are walking across the car park. My dad spots the Royal Marines officer in uniform and a priest. He immediately gets it, drops to his knees, like, Cyrus is dead. And like, that's just hit me emotionally because I've told that story so many times before having a son. Didn't bother me at all. I'd be like, yeah, my dad was obviously a pain, but now I've got a son. <sighs> the thought of someone telling me your son's going to die, break, broken, broken man. That, that's the only thing in this world that would completely destroy me. So what, the, so they, as you went to a coma then, so they went to see your dad, but like, what did they tell your dad? Did they just say that you was in a coma or that you died? Cyrus is about to die. It's not looking good for him. And you need to go out and see him before he dies. So they flew him to Afghanistan. They were about <clears throat> to fly him. Three days later, I woke up out of the coma. They'd made the preparations for the flight and everything. I woke up out of the coma and they said, he's not about to die. He's awake now. We might be able to save him. Well, we think we can save him. Don't fly out, we'll handle it. So they didn't fly him out to see me. And I'm very glad of that because I experienced some things in hospital for the next two months that I needed to experience on my own. If my dad would have been with me, I don't think I would have quite got it. And I believe that that accident happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. What were those things that you went through though? The realizations? Yeah, like what, what you mentioned, um, the things that you went through and that you wouldn't have gone through if he was there, like what did you go through? Right. So I uh, I had two operations in hospital. I'll get to that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the full, okay. the full thing. I was, I was thinking maybe he's going to try and skip past it, but no, if we get to that, that's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll go through my full experience in the hospital and I'll tell you exactly what I learned. I woke up and I was in no pain still, probably pumping me full of light stuff. Um, I had massive damage, uh, damage to the nerves next to my eye, so I couldn't see. Uh, I had ear damage, I couldn't hear properly. Obviously, jaw was all, all messed up, and they had a massive tube in my throat. And I immediately woke up and grabbed this tube and tried to pull it out of my mouth. Cause yeah. It was just like, and I was yanking on it, and it wouldn't move even a tiny bit. I remember thinking, damn, they've put this thing in deep. Like, I can't even move it a bit. And the nurses tied my arms down. And I was, the, my arms were tied down for like six days. And when they untied them, I couldn't bend my arms. So I'm lying there like, this <laughs> sucks, man. Um, couldn't speak, obviously. Just like crippled, just like, oh, yeah, know. yeah, yeah, just like out of it. And like, and my brain had taken a hit. So I wasn't like thinking properly. Um, and, and my body was pulling me into a sleep, man, like deep. Like I, I would wake up for like 10 minutes. And then you go back and again. just be like pulling me into the sleep. Like, oh, I'm so sleepy, you know, 23 hours a day sleeping for like the first few days. Had an operation, don't remember the first one. I remember the second one, they told me you're gonna go for a surgery, went in for the surgery, woke up on a operating table in surgery, after the surgery, all the doctors and nurses are everywhere, these beaming lights beaming down on my head. 
I had all these tubes and everything still coming out of me. I remember vi very vividly opening my eyes. I was alone in hospital, right? There was no, no family there or anything. I was in a man. And I was thinking, wow, that's a lot of pain. That was the first time I felt pain. It was like extreme pain in my head. I was like, wow, that's strong. But I understand that why my head would be hurting. And I had this ringing in my head. And I was like, I understand why I've got a ringing in my head but I was absolutely freezing, like the coldest I've ever been. I was shaking out of coldness. I thought, why are they not putting a blanket on me? Like, at least give me that, you yeah. know? Went back, healed, took me off all the machines, eventually took this damn thing out my throat. Then they wired my, wired my jaw shut and they took me to a military hospital to heal. And this is where the story begins. I had spinal fluid leaking out of my nose and when I'd do that, it would drip out like a tap. When I'd do this, it would go into my throat and I would swallow it. And the doctor told me, uh, if this doesn't stop in a few days, I'm going to stick this needle into your spine and we're going to have a look and see what's going on. This big, we're going to shoot it at my spinal cord, I guess, and have a look to see yeah, yeah. what was going on. So I was like, wow, this is, <clears throat> this is getting better and better. Still couldn't see properly. Everything was doubled and blurry. Hearing was still bad. Um, and I would communicate with the nurses through... Um, Right, right, right in there. There was one other guy in the room with me. It was a big room, like 20 beds. One guy that was opposite me, he was <clears> clearly <throat> disabled, had no control of his bowels, couldn't feed himself. He was distressed, clearly distressed, make, making noises. And uh, he was constantly trying to bite himself, you know, like it was, like, it was, it was, it was uh, not a pretty sight. But there was this old guy that would come every day and visit him for like an hour or so and then leave and, and the guy would walk in and he would come to the end of my bed and how are you how are you doing and uh, you know uh, the jaws wide uh, make some noises and he would go and see this guy and then he would leave and in that moment in hospital i was feeling very sorry for myself i thought i was my head was going to be disfigured for life it was like this big it was black my jaw was all messed up i couldn't see it properly hear properly before that since my parents divorced and I built up the belief that I was indestructible and nothing could hurt me. All the stuff through commando training, but like at the end of commando training, they give out an award to some recruits, the best recruits of each troop get, a, it's what it's called a diamond award. And on all my photos, when I passed out, I had this red diamond on my arm. I got given a diamond award and only two to four guys in every troop out of like 50, 60 guys get it. I got one. It's supposed to be for the best recruits and the one that show the most leadership potential. I had no leadership potential at that age. I did have an ability in the worst, most sleep-deprived, coldest, hardest times of commando training. I had an ability to think and be like, I'm going to be on camp in a few weeks or days, warm, eating hot food, and we're all going to be laughing and joking about this. So I could see through the pain in the moment and be like... <laughs> It's fine. Mm. You know, we're going to be on camp. So they saw that in me and I knew it, that I had that ability because everyone else had their heads down and they'd be feeling sorry for themselves. And I had my head up and I'd be laughing and joking, trying to bring the energy up. So, but in the moment in hospital, I lost that ability completely. And I was feeling very sorry for myself. I was running through the incident over and over and over again in my mind and it was still raw. And one day I wrote on my notebook, you know, what's the story with that guy? And I drew an arrow to him. There was no one I was in the room. I drew an arrow to him. Like there was loads of people in there, but there was one other guy. And the nurse said, oh, um, yeah, he was involved in a car accident some months back. He was driving with his mum and his sister in the car. His mum and sister died in the accident. He's permanently disabled. He still has full capacity of his mind. He's very aware, but in no control over his body. The reason why he keeps trying to bite himself is because he's trying to kill himself. He feels guilty for killing his mum and sister. And that old man that visits him is his father. And I went, wait, what? This old man has just lost his wife and his daughter. And his son's like this for life. And he's trying to top himself every minute of the day. But he walks in the hospital with a smile on his face and looks at me and asks me if I'm okay. And I was just like, I don't get it. I feel like an idiot. And I felt shame. Shame on you 
of feeling sorry for yourself with this scratch. And this is going on right in front of you. I felt so bad. And I was just like, literally sat up and, and you know, held my head up. And I was like, fuck this. I'm going to get through this. And mm. Immediately changed my mindset in that moment. And I started walking around the hospital more, talking to the nurses and telling myself, I'm going to fucking get through this. And not immediately, but a few days after that, I was running through the incident again in my head, like I would do thousands of times a day. It was just on Did you have nightmares about it? Yeah. 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 It was on, it was in my mind constantly. And I think that anyone that goes through an incident like that near death experience is going to have that. It's going to be like a physiological response and you're just going to have it looping, right? Because it's such a traumatic event. However, I also know for a fact now that it all happened for a reason. It was all planned out through the universe or whatever you want to call it, right? And I hadn't quite got the lesson yet. And I was running through it a few days later and I realized again, like a big light bulb, oh, I was on my deathbed. And during that moment of complete clarity, I was upset, angry and frustrated because I was about to die and I had massive regret that I was 21 and had not lived life. So when that moment comes again, everyone dies. I don't want to feel like that. And that's what I got in hospital in that moment. My job now is to live life on my terms, how I want. And when that moment comes again, I don't want those same feelings because that was horrible. I was like so upset. So now that stayed with me. The two things have stayed with me. One, one is when stuff seems to be going bad, you're not having a bad day. Shut your fucking mouth. You're not having a bad day. That guy was having a bad day. Yeah. And this old man was having a bad day. You ain't got shit on that. So stop feeling sorry for yourself and don't play a victim. And I realized that I needed to live my life. 100%. No holding back. And before the accident happened, I put in my notice to leave the Marines. I had my leaving interview in Afghanistan from the commanding officer, you know, a few weeks before the uh, incident happened. And he asked me, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, travel the world. And he was like, how are you going to travel the world? I, was like, I don't know, but I just want to go around the world, not in uniform. And he was like, that's ridiculous. Like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure something out. I just want to go out there and be free. And he was just like, <laughs> it convinced me not to, but he had to let me go because I'd done my time and I could have, I could left. So I, I I'd had the accident and when I was in my hometown, about a year later, I'd left and I was working as a scaffolding guy, like driver. Mm. And scaffolding and I was in my hometown and there's a place that I hated and I was drinking and doing drugs regulationally and I hated it. I got a payout from the military from the accident that allowed me to travel the world for the next four and a half years without a single worry about money or anything. How that, much did you get paid? I got paid in drips. So it was like over a period of time. Yeah. <clears throat> the initial Which kind of enabled you to not spend all your money at once. Mate, exactly. <laughs> I got paid total like a hundred and... 80,000 pounds. Wow. At 21, 22 by the time, over drips. Did you know that was coming? No. No. Wow. No, I didn't. I got paid 20,000 pounds initially from the military as a comp through the military compensation scheme. Mm. And that allowed me 20,000 pounds at 22 was crazy. It's mad money, mate. And I just immediately quit my job and flew to Thailand immediately. Like a week after I got the money, I was in Thailand. I flew over to Thailand with a backpack on, with literally free shorts and a t-shirt or something, with a friend of mine, Danny. He was he, his uh, family had some money, and we and he was in the military as well. And we both said, "Let's go." And how long did you stay in Thailand for? Total two years. That must have been so much fun. Which part? I lived. Uh, we initially went there and did a scuba diving instructor's course because we thought it would be great to be scuba divers, and we stayed in Pattaya for eight months. Are you familiar with Pattaya? No, but isn't it like a proper party place? It's the seediest city on planet Earth. <laughs> and the diving shop... Is that why you stayed for eight months? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the dive shop, it was our first day in Thailand. 
we were in a taxi at the back of this um, pickup truck. There were seats in the back. It was the truck of the dive shop. It yeah. was taking us to the dive shop. There's different streets called Soy's. And the dive shop was on a Soy called Soy 6. It was six on the line of streets. It was mm. Soy 6. Soy 6 in Pattaya is a renowned street. It's where people go to fuck girls in in the shops of the street. It's called Short Time. You go there, you pay the girl, you, sh- you sleep with them. And you're literally them. working on that street. The dive shop was on the street and they say that it was there before the girls come. I'm like, man, why didn't you move it? But they had this shop and I don't know, they must have bought it or something and they kept the shop there. So every day, the taxi would go down the street and not thousands, but hundreds of girls on the street screaming. It was our first day in Thailand and they were all screaming. We were like, oh my God, this is insane. Like we didn't think it was going to be like this. It's the seediest city on planet Earth. It started from the soldiers or going to the beach to get some R&R away from the war. And obviously the, the locals heard about it and the girls would go there and you know sleep with the guys for some dollars or whatever. And now it's a massive city and it's just insane. You can't explain it. You have to go there to believe it. It's very seedy, just girls, all the guys, the full, the full thing, everything from, you know, and we lived there for eight months and we were just, you know, young, drinking, going out all the time. It's just never ending party, mm. never ending party. And we, we traveled around different places. Um, and after four and a half years of traveling, don't get me wrong, I loved every minute of it. Like it, it, I was enjoying myself. And it was probably the freest I've ever felt because I had the money in the bank. Yeah. And four and I, a half years, yeah? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Two years in Thailand. Uh, I got into some, uh, I moved to Phuket and did some Muay Thai and for uh, doing Muay Thai and fitness was always a part of my routine. Like ever since I was 13, since I saw that photo, I've always done fitness, but diet was way off. Uh, alcohol was like way in, not too much of it, like five days a week drinking, mm. living the time. I grew dreadlocks. Imagine I had dreadlocks, right? Just full bum life. Mm. And I knew I wanted more out of life. And there's only so many times you can go to a beach and say, this is nice, right? I was bored out of my mind. And I, I just moved to Dubai on a whim on my own with my stuff. From yeah. Thailand? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and that's where my that kind of Dubai journey started. Um, Four and a half years, wow. And um, just a quick one with the whole Muay Thai thing. How So how long did you, were you doing Muay Thai for as well? I was in Thailand for a total of two years. I wasn't doing it in Pattaya. Mm. When I moved to Phuket, I was doing it. One of my very good friends, Kev, was a professional Muay Thai fighter. He was also in the military with me, in the Marines with me. And he was really good at Muay Thai. Like he was on the TVs fighting. He was going around Bangkok fighting in the best stadiums. And he's got the body for it. And he loved <clears> it. And I basically looked at him doing it. I was like, wow, that looks so cool. I want to do it. I ain't got the body for Muay Thai. I ain't got the mind for it. Um, this is pure punishment, isn't it? Absolute destroying each other. And before a fight, you would sit down on a little wooden chair next to the ring and they would make you watch the fight before you. And I never understood why they do that. Because you sat there, shit in your pants, watching these guys elbow each other's faces, thinking, what the fuck am I doing? Mm. Why am I doing this? That's what I used to think anyway. (laughs) But I'm really glad I did it because I believe as men, we have it built into us to want to fight. Yeah, We are fighters. We used to kill each other and hunt and and fight all the time so going through that and going into a ring and having someone standing in front of you like well, i'm gonna i'm gonna knock your head off right yeah that is an awesome experience for a man to do especially when you do it as well yeah it's 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 really good i won one sermon lost american guy did a spinning elbow to my nose and knocked me out and my nose was like i'll show you a photo <laughs> it's on my phone after this like ben on my face and <laughs> I went to the hospital and told the doctor, uh, like I walked into the hospital with my friend and the doctor went, hmm, what's the problem? And my friend started laughing and I was like, uh, my nose. <laughs> and he was like, okay, let me have a look. He was like, not broken. And my friend started laughing her head off. And I was like, what do you mean not broken? And he was like, not broken, not broken. Cartilage, cartilage. And he drew a picture and cartilage damage and come back tomorrow, specialist here, he will help you. So I went home, I was lying on my bed and my nose was over here. 
and, and I was like, he can just see one eye just like <laughs> I was like not broken and he, he said that the specialist will, t- will, will take care of it tomorrow so the next day he comes walked into the special off- specialist office as I opened the door I haven't even sat down yet he goes broken nose and I was like yeah obviously <laughs> so I had surgery on him <clears throat> um, and I stopped Muay Thai after that yeah I was like nah nah it's, it's not, not worth it yeah for me so dubai so how did you how did you come to hear about dubai then because back in 2013 is when you moved here right so i mean it wasn't as popular a place to be it was just after the crash like people were a bit like wasn't as popular as it is now so what 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 spurred dubai on i honestly don't know it was an intuitive feeling i had about the place i guess don't don't forget i've been traveling Traveling was uh, not foreign for me. Like I went to North America, Central America, all around Southeast Asia. We were used to just packing up a backpack and going to a different country. Yeah, so just going somewhere new didn't didn't phase you at all. No, it didn't. But I wanted to go somewhere entrepreneurial. I had in my mind every time I'd wake up hungover, I'd be like, Man, "This again." There's more to life than this. Yeah. yeah, and I and I was out of shape, and I was into fitness, and Dubai felt like the place for me to go so I got a job uh, working as a personal trainer in fitness first and that's where it that's where it started had you done fitness before that like had you done any personal training before yeah yeah I had done yeah I was I was always I did my uh, qualifications to be a personal trainer way before that five years before that it was somewhere when I left the military I did my personal training qualifications I was working as a scaffolder and at the time a lot of the guys were going to do private security. <clears throat> that was like big money for guys that were yeah. former Marines and paras and special forces. They were, and all my friends were doing that. And I did my qualifications for that actually at some point. But I realized that that was not going to be something I'd necessarily enjoy. Yeah, And it would have just been for the money. And I was so passionate about fitness, even though I was drinking and recreationally doing drugs and stuff, I was still fit doing fitness all the time and never stopped so I was like no I want to do something I enjoy for a career and always knew eventually the money was going to run out and I'd have to do a job and do something so I decided on a fitness and I was actually working for Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand when I was there as, as the CrossFit instructor there and I was doing the classes there you know I was working for like an hour max two hours a day I was training for four hours a day doing Muay Thai and the rest of the time I was just on the beach drinking and yeah and how was it like fitness first is always an interesting one. It's like, it's like a landing ground for, for personal trainers. It was. Yeah. And then they just kind of like do it for a few months, realize it's shit and then off they go. Yeah. So at what point did you, cause you've obviously gone on to set up now, obviously a successful business, but at that point you knew nothing about business. Absolutely so not. how was the transition from personal trainer into actually starting your own business? I'd been in fitness first a few months and I met a guy that was um, a family member. He was like my dad's second cousin. I'd never met him before, but I heard he was in Dubai. So my dad was like, go meet him. And he was a banker. He was the CFO for Standard Chartered at the time. His, his name was also Cyrus. So we met up and I, you know, we got speaking and he could see like the passion in me that I wanted to do something. And he had, I had a bit of money. So we decided we were going to open up a, a CrossFit box. It was my idea to do CrossFit because I was into CrossFit at the time. So I left the gym. He invested, I think it was about 1.2 million dirhams at the time with a friend. And I did the work. And that was three and a half years of my life. And it was my university, I guess you could say. Yeah, right? a lot of learning. I got thrown into the deep end of a business and I was a bum traveler. And I had lost... You know, I always say to people, people think that if you're in the military that you automatically have discipline. Mm. You don't. You're in an environment that's conducive to the environment. When you leave the environment, all the discipline you have unravels. Yeah. So I was this bum, beach boy, traveling, Muay Thai-ish guy that would, was drinking five days a week, partying. And now I was a business owner. And I had employees and I had to just learn. And honest to God, I would sit at the computer. I would, my jet, it was hard. Like it was a lot of work to do. And I don't think I was quite ready to do that amount of hard work. But 
something happened when I was in fitness first, I met my wife. My wife is like way above my level of like looks. Like everyone says your wife's beautiful. How, how did you manage that? I don't know how I managed it. I was earning, I was earning like 4,000 dirhams at the time. Uh, she was earning, uh, you know, eight to 10 times more than me. It's mm -hmm. good looking, had a great job, very confident. And I was just like bum, you know, bum guy. Uh, but we just, we fell in love and that drove me. That like got me out of my funk of like drinking and partying. And yeah, you just want to be a better person for her. And it didn't feel right. I was like, wow, she's earning more money than me. That's not right. Like mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable with that. And I had dreams and goals, but I wasn't acted on them yet. I was on my own. I didn't give a shit. But she made me level up. Not because she said anything to me. She was fine the way I was. I wasn't fine with it. So we got married and I told her, I was this party guy, you know, whether we were going out drinking in restaurants and we were living this life and I was on the very like end of my money from the accident and I'd spent it all. And then we got married and I told her, I'm done with this life. I'm stopping right now. I'm going to work. And I stopped drinking. I stopped going out with her. I didn't see her. I went to the gym and from five o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, I was in my business. And she was still going out? And she was. She was still going out, very much so. She didn't stop it. We fought so much, man, in those early days. Because she met you and you were that guy. And then you change. So it's like the Overnight guy- Overnight changed. So the guy that she's actually met is now disappeared. And here's she, a new guy. She met a guy who had been free in every sense of the word. No girlfriend, no limits. Do whatever the fuck I want, when I want, for so long. And she met a guy that was carrying these deep-rooted traumas from his parents splitting up. So we were like bouncing off the walls in this apartment. We met each other. We moved in six weeks later. We got married six months later. Wow. Mate, it was an explosion <clears throat> of personalities. If you'd have been a fly on the wall, you'd have said, what the fuck are these two humans doing together? Just <laughs> split up. And we nearly did so many times. Nearly. What, what, what kept you holding on? Man, we were close, man. We were very close. I mean, there's one, one time when we were fighting and I was, it got not physical with each other or kind of did like we were like like uh wrestling each other kind of and you know it just gets so heated and i pulled the curtains off and the pillows were everywhere and her brother come around because she would call the brother and he was like what the hell is going on now um so that's how bad it got and i had i was conflicted massively conflicted one side of me I would wake up every single morning and the voice would come in my head, divorce, divorce. How are you going to divorce her? And I'd plan out a divorce in my head every single morning without fail. How are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? Didn't have the balls to just tell her I wanted to divorce her. I was trying to like plan out a situation that would end up us not being apart, right? And the other side of me was like, she's beautiful. She's loving. She's loyal. What the fuck else do you want, man? I mean... So I had the two, it was completely split 50-50. And when we got married in Abu Dhabi, we signed the papers. I was, <laughs> I was a mess. Like I did not want to be there. She could sense that in me and I was moody and grumpy and we did it. And that was the side of me that, that was the, the trauma mm. from when my parents divorced, right? I had this belief. So eventually what happened with my wife is, um, we were on the brink of, of uh, divorcing and she'd grown apart from me because I was so cold and I, I was just not having any of it. And we were fighting and um, I was reading a business book. I became a ferocious reader in this time that I wanted to become successful. I've read probably more than 500 books at this point. And I was working in my business and I was very focused in that sense, you know, and I started to get in shape and I started to eat better and all that stuff was going up, but the relationship was still falling yeah. apart. I read a book. He's the founder of Lululemon. Uh, you know Lululemon, yeah, the clothing yeah. brand? Yeah. His book, he talks about something called the Landmark Forum, which is a seminar that he went on. And he said in the book, I always look at my life as before the forum and after the forum. It was a very powerful, um, beneficial experience. And it's one of the reasons why Lululemon was so successful. And I was like, damn, this sounds like an awesome seminar. Google. Two weeks later, the same seminar is in Dubai. I'm like, damn, paid in the moment, paid. Go back to reading the book, I'm going. 
So I turn up at the seminar. Have you heard of the Landmark Forum? No, I haven't, no. Right, it blows my mind that people don't know what this <clears> thing is. Two and a half million people have done it globally. And um, I went on there thinking, you know, they give you a call before the call. What do you want to get out of it? Business, money. Yeah, cool, great, you'll get that. Um, fine, I'm awesome, I'm in. Go there, all keen, sit down, immediately realize this is not about money. This is not about business. This is weird. But again, the universe needed to hide the fact that this was a a, uh, a deep dive into self because I never would have gone on it. And it disguised it for a business book for me so I could go there and receive this gift. He starts talking about life and the voice in your head and what that voice is and starts talking about past traumas and how we carry them into, into adulthood. I almost didn't go back for the second day. Go to the second day. On the second day, they talk about parents and your relationship with them. And you know my story mm. with the mum, right? And they said, if you haven't got, if you're not speaking to your parents right now, and they did this whole thing, go and speak to them because you can't live life fully if you're not, if you don't have a harmonious relationship with the humans that brought you into this world. Very important. So I, I went off and pretended to call my mum. I ain't called my mum. These people are crazy. Um, we did all these other stuff. I went back for the third day and they said, on the last day, at around 5 p.m., you're going to get a realization. And it's all going to make sense. We were sat in these chairs for 12 hours a day. We didn't eat much. We're not allowed to take notes. You've just got to sit there and listen. And you are engaged as fuck. Like, you're not bored. And on the last day, it, things were heating up, right? And people were crying and things were getting tense. And it was like a couple of hours away from this thing. And I was like, hey, getting this this thing they're talking about like no way like i'm just gonna finish and go home and fine i learned some things but you know the hour the minute the second that they say you're getting this realization a bullet hit me in the head and i hair all the hair stood up on my body it just rushed through me and i felt a release and I cannot say any words right now that will explain this. Mm. You have to experience it. But if I was to put it into words and try and put it into words, for the first time ever in my life, I looked into a mirror and I saw why the way I was. Why am I so stubborn? Why do I think I'm unbreakable? Why do I believe relationships are doomed to fail? Why am I thinking of this divorce all the time? All of it, my full personality of life, all the experiences, it was right there. And then the realization was that you don't need to carry that with you anymore. Let it go and be whoever the fuck you want to be. So I was floating after this forum. And although I'd realized that the issues in my relationship might have been me, I still had that ego that was like, nah. It's not you, it's her, right? And, and then I was like, oh, can it be me? Maybe because of my parents, I don't know. So I went to therapy and the nice gentleman, his name's Juan, he's from uh, Lighthouse. I was sat down with him and he was taking me through things and he got it immediately, he, like told him my whole story, but he didn't tell me. He wanted me to figure it out for myself. And I had the realization from the forum and the voices of divorce and it kind of stopped, but they were kind of still there and there was still a lot to figure out. Mm. And it, we got through all these sessions of therapy and it was like this thing that was in the room that I could see, but I couldn't say it because I didn't want to admit still, my ego was still just holding on like just a few more days and he's going to stay with me. And he was like, Cyrus, do you get it yet? And I went, the problem's me. He went, Problems you mate. You've got the issue, not your wife. And I was like, oh, damn. And that's the first time I spoke it out that I had a problem. And wow, I the voices in my head to stop the divorce immediately went away. And I never from that day thought about divorcing my wife again. And I got over the trauma of my parents' divorce through the landmark forum <clears throat> specifically and then the therapy after it. I needed the therapy after it because my <clears throat> ego was so big, but the, the Landmark Forum, I tell everyone about it. And I don't know why people don't do this. I mean, it it's insane how they do it. It's been going since the 70s. And my wife always tells me the best thing you ever did was a Landmark Forum. <laughs> really? Wow. And how long have you been married now? 
10 years in April. Wow. And how's the relationship now? Amazing. It's not perfect. I mean, you know, we have ups and downs, but... Never wow. is, right? Yeah. I truly believe, like everything else, our spirits were meant to come together. We were meant to go through all that crap. And I believe that uh, we're supposed to be together. I really honestly believe that, that we are supposed to be together. And whether we'll last a lifetime together, I don't know. But I do believe that uh, we're supposed to... We're supposed to meet each other at that exact time. And um, again, like... I look at through my life and all of these things that have happened and I honestly believe that we all have a goal, right? You've got a vision for yourself and this business that you start in and you have a dream and this, this life that you want to live, the, the people that you want to meet, the body and health that you want, the money that you want to earn, the kind of wife and kids that you want. You've all, everyone's got this goal that they want. And I believe wholeheartedly that the universe knows that. Universe knows you want this. So in order to achieve all these things that you want, you need to become a certain type of person. You need to overcome challenges and grow yourself. So when we get a challenge, like my accident in Afghanistan, it's a puzzle. It's a game. You've got to solve it so you can level up. And the bigger the vision you have for yourself, the bigger the challenges the universe is going to throw at you because you have more distance to go. Mm. But when we get these challenges, we play victim. And we say, oh, why is this happening to me? This is bullshit. I don't want to go through this. That's you. That's a gift. The universe is giving it to you so you can solve it and level up and get closer to the goal that you have for yourself. Yeah. And that's what I've realized throughout my life. There's a book um, written by Ant Middleton called The Fear Bubble. And uh, he speaks a lot about that. And it's so true because <clears throat> you go through life like, and that's how your brain's designed, right? Your brain's designed to protect yourself. But in reality, all it's doing is making excuses for the things. And I think one thing that I love about the podcast is it's helped me become very self-aware about my own situation. Mm. Um, and I think being self-aware is so key. And, and obviously, you know, I mean, I've had some times with my girlfriend recently, which have been really challenging. And um, I spoke to my therapist about it. And he was like, said the same thing. He's like, it's got nothing to do with her. It's you. Like you're like, you're making her feel this way because of how you're acting. And it was just, yeah, it, it's very uh, enlightening moment. And it's, it's, it's so important to have that moment of being self-aware, but it's, there's a saying, isn't there? Right. Hard times make hard men. Yeah. Weak times. Is it, is it that? Yes. Hard times make hard men, weak yeah. times make weak men. Absolutely. And it's so true because if you don't go through, like there's so much shit that I had to go through for my life to get through where I am today. Yeah. But if I hadn't been through it, you know, and I, I often think about it, about would I change the path that I've been on? And I think whilst there probably could have been a more constructive path, I am here for a reason. And, you know, I've probably far exceeded what my actual expectations were at the beginning so you just kind of got to, you got to thank it. Absolutely. It's all a part of your life and everything you've been through has happened to you. Shaped you into that person. For a reason. Yeah. And now you are where you are only because of the stuff that you've got over, yeah. man. Yeah. hundred percent. So with the, uh, with the old gym then. So yeah. at what point did that kind of, did you go, right, I want to get out of this and do my own thing? Yeah. Um, my business partner or investors, let's say, had promised me we'd negotiated it was 22.5 percent of the business was going to be mine for running it i don't know how we come up with 22.5 but that was a number um and it became apparent to me at some point that they weren't actually willing to give me that part of the business it was more of just like a handshake verbal agreement and everyone that's into business will laugh and say you did all this on a handshake with a family member it's like the worst possible scenario yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? but i was young and keen and wanted to do it and i'm glad i did it even my wife was telling me everyone was telling me you know, get out of it, do this and that. But I, again, I'm, I'm a believer in just go, walking the path that you feel is right, going with your intuition. And and I wouldn't have changed it because I learned how to run a business through that scenario. I got something from it and a little bit of money uh, at the end when our paths uh, cross. So um, during my time in my first gym, I was lucky enough to land a job working for a member of the royal family as a coach. 
And um, so I had, I was doing that and I was had my clients and I was just kind of in between things. I always knew I wanted to start a new business. So I was in London with my client and I saw some concepts that I liked that involved boxing and fitness. I come back to Dubai and I did what anyone would do in that scenario and, and just spoke to the most successful person I knew in business. And that was a friend that I used to train with in CrossFit called Lee, Lee Borg. He's a very successful man. He's like 42, 43 years old. He's into luxury real estate and he is a go-getter, every sense of the word. So I told him about my idea and he said, mate, I can advise you and guide you, no problem. Like you're one of my good friends, no worries. Um, What's the concept? I told him and he said, okay, how much research have you done? Mm, went to a few gyms in London. Okay, you need to do more research, mate. And he channeled my passion for this new business that I had and guided me and just put my energy in the right direction. So I flew to New York, spent a week there, did like four or five classes a day, gathering information, taking photos, writing notes. Me and Lee flew to Amsterdam because we liked the look of a gym there called Saints and Stars that was like a very high-end boutique. Did all the research. Along the line, Lee decided, you know what, mate? Love it. I want to jump in with you. You go in 50, come up with half the cash. I'll come up with half the cash and we'll go in. So half of the cash was a million dirhams. I didn't have a million dirhams cash. I had some of it that I'd saved, but I had to borrow a bit off my dad and you know, scrimp and scrape here and there. Come up with it. Started to fit out. We'd invested. Fit out was going on. COVID hit. I remember standing outside of the gym or the building site and Lee telling me, we're going to go into this thing called a lockdown. And I always call Lee Houdini because he knows things before it happens because he speaks to all these people, right? He says, we're going to go into this thing called lockdown and we're going to have to stay in our houses. And I was like, what are you talking about? Two weeks later, we're in a lockdown. I was transferring money from my personal savings account into the business account thinking, I'm never going to see this again because we we didn't know what the hell was going on. Mm, yeah. We were so unsure. I was like, this is, this, is gonna, oh, this is horrible. This is horrible. Boom, boom. But we got through it and, you know, Lee was kind of there to support me and put his hand on my shoulder and say, mate, it's going to be all right. We're going to get through this and we're going to we're going to survive. And for a few times, it was almost not going to survive. You know, don't get me wrong. We had large expenses and there was no one coming to gyms after COVID. We opened two weeks after lockdown. Yeah. When you launch a business, mate, it's like, you'll know this money just disappears. Hey, it's crazy. Just dissolves, like goes. Like, yeah. it's like, where the fuck has that gone? That's why I don't make business plans. Someone asked me yesterday, what do you do? Get a spread? I'm like, I don't do business plans. I, I don't want like, to know how much money I'm spending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just do it and you figure out as you go along. And it was stressful, man. It was very stressful. Yeah. And we... But you opened? Yeah, we did. And we... Just after COVID? Yeah. After lockdown, but yeah. Yeah, after lockdown. And we masks and we went down to like eight people in a class at one point. We we're supposed to have 34 originally, but slowly but surely, I, I don't count that first year in business as the first year. Like when I'm speaking to investors and stuff now, I'm like, yeah, but it was after COVID. Like it wasn't not a normal year. It was tough, but we scraped through, you know, with the help of Lee, my business partner, and just a, I had a vision for Boxica before I started it. And we had four different locations that we were going to set up in. We had a unit in DIFC, one in Al Sakal Avenue, one in Marina in a Damak building, and the one we have in Studio City. And Studio City is very family oriented. Good location, yeah. And the type of vision I had for the gym was unintimidating, fun, accessible for everyone, mm. a second home like feel for people. And I thought that type of crowd would live in or in and around Studio City, right? Very villas, families, and that, that type of thing. So we built a strong community of people. A lot of gyms say that, right? But if you go on Google and you look at reviews, Boxica for a small boutique, it's got over 200 reviews and 99% of them are five star. And in almost, uh, not almost all, but I'd say like 75% of those, they mention community. Yeah. We have a very good community of yeah, people. Yeah, with any successful business, you have to have a good community. And that's what we did. And that's how we got through the COVID. It was just a relentless focus on building that. And our tagline in the early days of the business was find your inner hero. And that was just some stuff we'd come up with. But during lockdown, after lockdown, when people were coming to the gym, they kept saying, this is my therapy. This is my therapy. So we changed the tagline to boxing is therapy. And 
we made it like a second home for people. And we got to a stage in the business where we were like, okay, this studio is working, our boxing fitness concept. People started asking for more, you know, our customers were like, oh, but we want to, you know, we want, we want to do more different types of fitness. Have you got, are you going to open up something else? So that was when we, had, we were in like this crossroads where we were now running a profit. We had relatively low overheads. It was you know, million, two million dirhams to open up that one studio. What are we going to do now? And there was two spaces available in the building for rent. So we just immediately took them on rent. We didn't know what we were going to do. We were like, let's expand. We took the whole back side of the building. We took these two leases, made a cafe and a spin studio. And we did another boxing circuits area and just like, total investment now is like over a million dollars and and we're doing you know way over a million dollars in revenue and we have over 600 members and it all started with that one small studio just focusing on building a community yeah what would you say to the biggest parts of the like you've learned because your your entrepreneurial journey has been quite short so far so what would you say like you've learned so far from from the first gym and now boxica um i focus on people that's something that I've learned. If you get the wrong people in your business, they haven't got the right vision and, and if they're not the right type of personality for your business, especially a service business where you're in front of customers every day. Um, I've learned that. I've learned that. I heard a saying about that is, and it was so good because <clears throat> I mean, uh, like in, in the business that I'm with at the moment, it's kind of like the opposite of this, but I believe strongly in what you've just said there. And I heard somebody say it, so well and they're like hire slow fire fast yeah i've made all those mistakes i've hired fast i've fired slow and through the mistakes that i've learned with people i've learned how to do it and what i do is when i'm hiring someone now i sit down with them and i ask myself would i hang around with this person if it wasn't for this yeah job i don't even ask questions about their education or anything or job experience i'd want to know them Absolutely. and if i like them i'm like okay this person can be hired uh, mate you nailed it <clears throat> right it's all on the personality these coaches are going to be in front of our customers carrying the message of the community and everything they have to be good people they have to be likable mm. and they have to really care about the job so i sit down and ask myself would i hang around with this person if it wasn't work if the answer is yes that's ticked do they care about the job? And do they care about people? Tick, yes. I don't care how much experience you've got. I'll teach you everything else. Yeah. So that's one thing, the mm. people thing, right? And also, I had you know three and a half years experience running a business, which is my first one, and I wasn't that experienced. And my business partner, Lee, was experienced. And that was key for me. Partnering with him, in the early days was one of the reasons why I am the way I am today in business sense. And he was invested in the business. He was never, he was involved massively in the early days. Like he was there. If I call him 24 seven, he'll answer the phone. Mm. Mate, I've got this thing going on. What do you want to do? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Do it like this. Great. And over the years of just calling him and speaking to him and having that time with someone that's successful. Now I've learned to think like him. Yeah. So if something comes up, my brain goes, what would Lee do? Blah, 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 do it. And I just make this, I'm confident enough now to do that. But yeah. in the early days, I wasn't, I would call him. And like, I, I've said this recently in a video on my Instagram, like I called him for two reasons. One, because I thought I needed to, because he's my business partner. And I wanted him to be involved in everything. But really, if I'm going to be honest with myself, I needed his assurance. I wasn't confident enough to make the decision yet. So partnering with someone that has the experience that you don't, or the confidence or something that's lacking in you, right? I was the fitness guy, he was a business guy and, and, and it just works. Yeah, it's a very lonely place, business. And uh, I've interviewed so many people that when I talk about their journeys, I'm like, would you do anything differently? And all the ones that started a business alone said, if I was ever starting a business again, I'd do it with somebody else. And uh, I've, I really resonate a lot with that. And I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's a good point you mentioned there is like having that sounding board um, and then getting to the point where you've got that courage to then go, right, I can make that decision, decision myself. Yeah, people, man. It, like, <laughs> since moving to Dubai, there's four people that have helped me and influenced me the most. My wife got me off my ass, right? Mm. And got me to 
lit a fire up my ass and, and actually get something done. My current business partner, he inspires just from pure action. He just is himself and you're around him and you're like, damn, this guy is yeah, like you, killing. Yeah, you just, especially the man inside you wants to be like that level of guy. Just being around him is like, Cause wow. Because that, that sort of trait, you know, it's not not attractive as in a, in, a, in a sexual sense, but it's like attractive in a sense, which is like, I'm inspired by that, yeah. by that, the aura of that person. It's just Absolutely. like, and it's, it's like, if we go back to, you know, a thousand years ago, it's the dominant guy that just goes out and hunts. Do you know what I mean? He's that guy. And, and a lot, I did a podcast with a masculinity coach and it is funny because that, that tends to be beaten out of men nowadays because the whole feminism thing and wanting pe women to be powerful. And it's like, we, they can do that and that's great. And we, we encourage it, but yeah. we should do it together, not Absolutely. one or the other. Absolutely. We're men. We've already spoke about this. We evolved in hard times and we mm -hmm. thrived and we fight and we kill and we take over. That's in our DNA. Yeah. Can't escape that. And society over time has just put us on a stepping stone to less of the killing more of the end but you st like uh, again it was one thing that i spoke about recently as well is like it doesn't matter what you do just whatever you do have a purpose mm. and i think i went to again with a masculinity coach um i met some of the people in his kind of like brotherhood group mm. and um you know you talk to a lot of these men and they're lost and it's like like in that group and they need to be around other men to like bring them out of their shell because mm. they've kind of followed a life of somebody else and with culture that they you have here and mm. you know it's like arranged marriages and you should and, and everyone's making a decision for you mm. so you don't and then you get to this point of like midlife crisis where you're like 45 50 and you're like fuck i've done mm. everything according to somebody else's life not my own so slightly digress in there but like having that aura around is so important because it's just a reminder of like i need to you we need to, every man has that within them they need it like yeah. they need that purpose they need that get, get up and drive like need to, to be the one that's just dominating in in an, in a healthy sense as well no absolutely mate you're 100 percent right they, we get told by society that we're supposed to be like xyz mm. and we're not as men it's not in our dna to be like that yeah and so we become depressed and we go on drugs and we drink lots of alcohol to numb our pain. Yeah, to escape that reality, yeah. We get anxious and we, and, and we become shadows of, of what we're supposed to be. Mm. And that's why I say the gifts I got given from the universe showed me, you know, hey, you need to live your life yeah. on your terms, right? And, and hey, I'm going to give you things and their gifts and handle them like a man and solve the challenge. Don't feel sorry for yourself and level up in life. Mm. Right. Or, Hey, if you don't set a plan B and you go after your deepest desires, you will do it if you don't give up. Mm. Right. These are the lessons I got through my life when, as, as I went through the things. And I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the don't give up part is, is like, it's something that's just, it's such a simple part of um, anything that you do. But again, going back to the whole victimhood thing, shit ha stuff happens to people and they just go, oh, I'm just going to protect myself. I'm just not going to make that mistake again. I'm just going to give up. It's, nah, you just got to keep going. Just yes. make that note of that mistake. Because I've always said the same. You, you, you only fail if you, if you give up. Yeah. If you keep going, it's just you've learned a lesson. Absolutely, mate. Look at all the most successful people in the world. Look at their stories. I've, like I said, I've read over 500 books and a lot of them, the ones I resonated with the most were autobiographies. Mm. If I get hold of an autobiography. Uh, I love a good autobiography. Love it. Sucked in. Mm. I'm a sucker for them. I don't, I try not to start them because they take, it takes too much of my time. I'm like addicted to it, you know? Yeah. Men that started in a rag story and made the riches, best books ever. What is your favorite book you'd say that you've oh, read? man. Okay, you can give question. you can give us five. <laughs> I just did a I just did a podcast about this yesterday, a YouTube video about top five. But it was it was top five books for making money. Yeah, right. So that's different. It's a different thing. But I believe with books that you should be a reader, right? And I believe again that I keep saying the word universe, but you know, God, 
universe, life, the earth, energy, whatever you want to call it, puts things on your lap sometimes. In certain periods of my life that I like was in this perfect scenario to need a certain type of information mm. and a book's come to me and I've read it and it's hit so hard and I'll be like, wow, this is what I need right now. You know, and I, and I become obsessed with the book and I listen to it over and over and over and over or read it. And, and I just get the information in me. And I believe in the power of the subconscious mind. And I believe if you just hammer yourself with that information and you pour it into your subconscious, it will, you know, you, you'll act it out and you'll, and you'll change. So mm. books, I'll tell you one book, the book that I've listened to the most, I'll tell you that book. I used to listen to this book when I work out. I listened to it driving here today, a part of it. And I've always got it at the top of my Audible and I listen to parts of it all the time. And it's The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Wattles. Super powerful book. Really? It was written in the early, like 1918 or something. Wow. Still to this day, the principles in that book are life. It's, mm -hmm. about, it's about money, but you can apply it to anything. That book's just... You, you, I've listened to it so many times. It actually changes how you look at certain things in life. I believe I listen to affirmations a lot as well. Mm. Right. So before I go to bed every night, I'll put in my earphones for the last 10 minutes. I'll put on affirmations and I'll just lie in bed. And what's going on in my, what's going on in my ears is I can, I will, I am whatever successful, rich, happy. And I just get that in. As soon as I wake up in the morning, I've got a specific set of earphones that's for the bed. I wake up, I immediately put the earphones in and I listen to the affirmations. I am, I can, I will. And I believe that that massively changes how you look at certain mm. things in life, right? You look at something that used to look like a challenge and you, and you think, I, I can, I yeah. will, I am. <laughs> right? And you handle it differently. So Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Wattles. And th there's a specific one when you listen. To, do, you li do you read or listen? Uh, both. Uh, it depends. It depends on. So what's what's really, what I found really weird is I love listening to podcasts, but I also find that if I listen to a book, I take it in more if I read it. So what I do is I listen to it. If it's good, I then read it. Perfect. Awesome. Science of Getting Rich. Yeah. There's, I'll send you the link to the one I listen to. Because mm. I've downloaded two or three uh, of the same book on Audible. And one of them, the guy's voice hits different. You have to listen to that one. Yeah. I'll send it to you. Science of Getting Rich. So, how is your relationship with yourself now? With myself? Yeah. I, I got a coach uh, in the beginning part of the year. His name's Wes Watson. What type of coach? It was, it was specifically for business. I know a good personal trainer if you need any. Right. Awesome. <laughs> I've actually got a fitness coach as well. Someone that programs Have you? for me. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I, people ask me that all. I had this conversation. It was you, by the way. I was just joking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got that. Someone this morning was like, what do you do for your training? It's never funny if you have to explain the joke. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I was like, oh, I've got a trainer in America. And, um, and he was like, you've got a trainer? You've been a coach for 15 years. You're an expert. I'm like, yeah, but... But everybody needs coaching. Everyone needs a coach, mm. right? He programs things for me that, are, that I need to do, not that I want to do. He holds me accountable. I have good and bad days just like everyone else. Mm. Um, I've got with this coach and he's helped me change my mindset a lot. And I'm the type of guy that just needs someone not to tell me what to do. Like Lee, my business partner, just needs to live a certain way. And I immediately get it. I just need to be like that if I want some of that, right? So Wes is a coach and he's a very extreme human being. There's not many people like him on earth. Where is he based? America. He was in jail for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. He used to be a gangster. He left jail with $200 uh, gate money and now he makes $3 million, $3 million a month coaching people. Wow. Yeah. He's a very extreme, swears a lot. Gang, you know, all the tats massive, and a lot of people hate him, and a lot of people love him. But I went in this coaching group. It was like twenty thousand dollars, and uh, I got one call with him for twenty minutes, one on one, and the rest of it is just a group calls that I can't go on because of the time difference. I just listen to them, but he has helped me re 
uh, relook at my situation in my life and all the lessons that I've learned, it's kind of just reminded me of what I've been through and that I am stronger than what I think and I can achieve everything. And, and um, he's helped me instill discipline into my routine again, right? So right now, going back to your question of what, what, how are you with yourself? I'm very strong-minded, very focused, and laser focused on my on my goals of life and 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 to achieve where I want to go in life. That's where I feel. I feel unbreakable at the minute. I, I wake up four thirty in the morning every morning. It sucks, but I do it because I'm I'm building self confidence. I'm building trust. I'm in great shape. And it never was always like that. You can see on my social media when I when I was a trainer for so many years, I was out of shape, and I instilled that discipline in me. Again, I said it, I mentioned it earlier, like people think because you're in the military, they automatically have discipline. You don't, it's the environment. When you go into civilian life. You get taught it, but you have to implement it. Yeah. You have to have self-discipline here in mm -hmm. the real world, right? No, no one's disciplined. You haven't got a commando to scream and shout at you when you don't <laughs> do things that you need to do, right? You get off your phone, Cyrus. <laughs> yeah. Like you can come home from work and you can eat a load of crap. Nothing happens. You can skip the gym if you want. You can stay up late. You can go out boozing and you can drown yourself in this poison if you want. You can take drugs. No one's going to tell you what to, what to do, right? Mm. So in civilian, outside of the military, you need self-discipline. You need to discipline yourself. You need to build habits. And I did that from, you know, alcohol drinking, beach bummy style life to who I am today. It's just from instilling habits and being disciplined with myself, eating the food that I needed to eat, not that I wanted to eat, waking up at 4.30, because by doing so, I'm creating time of the day that no one else is up, that I can work on my goals. Mm. And also it sucks waking up that early. So every time I do it, I build a little bit more confidence, a little bit more self-trust. People ask me, how'd you do it? Why'd you do it? If you're out there and you're struggling with discipline, the first thing you can do is contact me and I can coach you. But you realize that getting in shape, getting your body in shape, right? You, you're obviously in great shape mm. yourself as well. And thank you. When you when you do that, you build a level of self-trust and confidence that people that are out of shape don't have. Because mm. what happens is they, they're out of shape and they hate it. No one's out of shape and says, wow, this is great. I'm awesome, healthy, looking good. No, you're not. You don't believe that. Like seriously, be honest with yourself. You want to be in shape. And what happens is people say, I'm going to go on a diet. And they start a diet and they do it for two weeks or, or a month. I hate that word, to be honest. Diet. Yeah, I hate right. it. They want to get better, right? They want to lose mm -hmm. weight. They want to be in shape. So they start looking at their food and they start training. And into it, at some point, they fail. They, they give up, right? You said it yourself earlier. You only fail when you quit. Mm. They do that. So they've told themselves they're going to get in shape. They've started the routine. They've done it for a while. And then they stop. What kind, what level of trust do they have with themselves? They don't believe, their brain doesn't believe them. The, the subconscious laughs at them. I'm going to earn this amount of money. Ha! There he goes again. I'm going to get into this type of relationship. Ha! I'm going to ask my boss for a raise in this. It's all a joke. Hmm. No, you, you've got no... No trust in your own word. When you actually get in shape, which is hard for people to do, and you stay on your diet long enough, and you go to the gym, and you build that body that you had, that vision. Now, when you tell yourself, yeah. I'm going to do X, Y, Z, it's different. I think it's. I think that is actually like the starting point for anything that you need to do. And and it's funny that you say that because I wake up similar to you, uh, not 4.30, but 5 o'clock every, every morning. Even if I don't want to, I wake up at that time now because my body's programmed to it. But I'm like, if you can do that at the first part of the day, and it's actually one of the most enjoyable parts because it's so silent. It's yeah. like, there's nothing going on. It's so peaceful. Yeah. I literally, my routine every morning without fail is wake up, go downstairs, make myself a copy, coffee. Um, and I sit in the garden on the floor with my legs crossed in my boxer shorts. And I just meditate for about 15 minutes. Awesome. And I just think, and I'm like, mate, what is my brain? And I've only actually started doing that routine in that order since I moved into this house. So right. it's only been a couple of months since I've been doing that, but I've always woken up at five o'clock. I either would, 
I'd either go and sit in the garden and have a coffee before, but the whole meditation thing, I started to really start to introduce that more. Mm. And I tell you what, it's, it's one of my favorite parts, parts of the day. Yeah, mate. Go, going for walks. I love, I love being alone with my own head. You know, like I love thinking about things, mm. you know, and I, for me, it's like a, an accustomed thing now. I do it all the time. If we ever go on travels with lads, I always go there either before or stay a little bit after so I can have some time alone. Right. And I, I always say to everyone, like, you, like, if you can't figure out what's going on in your head, like, how can you expect anyone else to? Yeah. So, yeah, so I got into this habit of just going downstairs every morning, making myself coffee, 5 a.m., sitting in the garden, meditating. And for me, it was like, it, it's, it's changed. It's changed. Like, I mean, I've always been into like, you know, the fitness in the morning. I train every morning in the morning. I was like, how do you do it? And I, I'm a big believer in if you get the hardest things done at the beginning of the day, you're like unbreakable for the rest of the day, yeah. you know? Whereas it's, I could easily like lay in bed, you know? And cuddle my cat and yeah. stay in that warm bed and yeah. you know but i'm like nah like this is this is a part of like building com like say confidence in yourself it's yeah. like building a bulletproof mindset that i'm achievable to do anything and i think what is key about these moments is everybody gets fixated on the end goal whereas if you just focused on making those tiny little steps oh mate those like it's like come everybody wants something now it's always like you know i want to take testosterone growth hormone i want to do this i want to get you know a tummy tuck i want to get and it's just like just it's so simple like if you want to achieve something in your life just start making the steps and now like yeah. you don't have to go an extreme but just try something small and then the next day try something on top of that mm -hmm. and then do and then all all that effort over a period of time will compound and you will have that you know and i think one of the the best ways to kind of as a, as a as a as a life kind of example is warren buffett you know yeah. the guy didn't become a millionaire until he was like i think in his early 50s or 60s but he just kept investing 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 mm. and now he's one of the most renowned investors and like as you said you can apply that to any part of your life mm. you just have to start tomorrow don't wait for new years don't wait for this don't wait for that yeah just start tomorrow and start with a small step. Maybe that is waking up at 5 a.m. for the first time. Yeah. Then going for a walk or whatever it might be. But yeah, the second you say you're going to do something and then lie to yourself, it then just implements all this all this uh, doubt, which will then tell you that here's your imposter syndrome. You know, whereas if you install yourself with confidence, I'm not saying you will never hear the imposter syndrome, but it's a lot easier to put it to sleep when you've installed loads of confidence in yourself and yeah and real life data yeah um mate i i i say the exact same thing to my clients i had a client a few days ago he wants to start waking up at 5 a.m and he come on board with me uh, and his main focus was weight loss mm -hmm. and i told him it is about the weight loss for you and we're going to focus on that and we're going to get it off but in the process you're going to change you're going to start trusting yourself more and you're going to start achieving much more in your life from losing the weight. And he wanted to start waking up at 5 a.m. And this last two weeks, like two weeks ago when I met him, he said his goal was to wake up at 5 a.m. But his, his alarm's been going off and he's been snoozing. And I said exactly what you've just said to him. I said, mate, you're losing weight and you're moving forward, building this confidence at one, one side, right? And you are feeling better in yourself, right? And he's like, I'm feeling awesome, man. I've lost five kilos. It's only been a few weeks, I'm loving it. And I said, but on the other side, you've told yourself you wanna wake up at 5 a.m. and you're not doing it, you're hitting snooze. So you're building confidence on this side and then you're losing it on this side. I was like, if you either tell yourself you're gonna do it and do it, something that's achievable that you can do, so you start building the confidence, or you don't do it. Mm -hmm. you, the worst thing is to be in between. Yeah. And small, exactly what you just said, mate, small steps done consistently over time builds massive amount of self-confidence and it the discipline that you build with yourself and your personal habits going to the gym getting in shape infiltrates all aspects of your life your business mind mm. right the, you look at someone and you shake their hands and you look at them in the eyes with a different kind of confidence when you have self-discipline yeah they feel that energy in you 
So what kind of deals are you going to go for? What kind of life are you going to create? Um, how are you going to speak to people? Your communication with people is key in this world, yeah. right? I find it. I find it as well when you talk, when I, a lot of my clients and I, uh, I talk about my lifestyle and it's almost like they have admiration for me because they wish that they could do what I do. Mm. Don't get me wrong. I'm fortunate that I don't have uh, children and stuff like that because mm. um, it is just my time. But yeah. I do feel like they look at me and think, I wish I wish I could do that. But anybody can do it. They just The difference between me and them is that I just get up and do it and they just get up and don't do it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. But listen, I really have enjoyed this conversation. I think it's one of the longest conversations that I've, I've actually recorded before, but I was dialed in from, from start to finish. Um, so thank you very much for joining the podcast. Um, no, thank you for having me. I, really I hope you had a good time. It. Yeah, it was awesome. It thank was a you. great conversation. One, I mean, uh, I'm, just, I'm sitting here and I'm just like bigging myself up. Like, yeah, it was a great conversation, but genuinely it was such an awesome conversation. Great, it's great to um, sit down and have a chat with like-minded people mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of wisdom that people can take from this. So if you are listening to this still and you're at the end, um, I'm sure you're going to be listening to that thinking, wow. So thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate it, you know, giving me your time. Um, I just want to provide as much value as physically possible because once upon a time, I was in a place where I was stuck, lost, and I didn't know what to really do with my life. So if I could have this back then, it would have been a life saving. So it's kind of the driver of why I do what I do for this podcast is so I can at least help one person. If one person just messages me and says that podcast was amazing, then I'm a happy man. So until next time, guys, also don't forget to give me a five star review. Uh, but yeah, until next time, guys, um, thank you very much. Don't forget to like, follow and subscribe. We'll see you again soon.